Dear brothers and sisters, members of St. John's London Baptist Church, and all of you who have tuned in to us on the World Wide Web, it is our joy and our privilege once more to join you or to have you join us as we worship God together. We acknowledge this morning that it is only because of God that we are alive. And it is only because of God that we are able to breathe, that we are able to sing, we are able to speak. And so we give him all of the glory this morning. We are here not for us. We are here not for form or for fashion, but we are here to worship Almighty God. And I pray that you will join me this morning, wherever you are, in your homes, uh, Wherever you may be in any part of the world today, join me as we worship God together. Welcome to our worship service today. And of course, this being the third Sunday of the month at St. John's, we would normally uh, emphasize the fact that God is still able to heal and God is still able to deliver. And so we refer to this Sunday as our prayer and deliverance Sunday. And so if you are in need of prayer today, uh, if you are struggling with some area of your life, we want to pray with you. There is no distance in prayer. And the hands of God are not short. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or even think. Let's look to God in prayer first of all as we ask his guidance on today's service. Let's pray. Almighty God, we acknowledge you this morning as almighty, all-powerful, the God to whom nothing is impossible. We acknowledge you as sovereign God, the God for whom nothing is a surprise. You are in control, you are in charge, and you are able, O oh God, to use circumstances and you are able to use situations and you are able to use man all for your purpose and to fulfill your glory and so we come today great God acknowledging that we are totally dependent on you without you we cannot live and without you we dare not die for we recognize that we have a God to glorify we have a hell to shine, a heaven to gain, and we have a soul to be saved. And it is your wish, great God, that every human being be saved. That we all come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. And so today, Father, I pray that through this service, through the singing, through the prayers, through the ministry of your word, that someone may come to a place in their lives where they would recognize that it is only through Christ and Christ alone that we can be saved. It is only through faith in his finished substitutionary work on Calvary that we can be saved. Open someone's eyes today. Deliver someone today, my God, from the power and the guilt and the penalty of sin. Lord, we pray that this service would be a blessing to all who hear. This is our prayer. In no other name but the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, let us join together wherever you are. Let's sing together one of the favorite hymns of the church. Great is thy faithfulness. We'll hear Brother Richard Taylor singing that for us. And we can join in wherever we are. And after he sings, we'll join the worship team as we worship together with a few choruses that will bring honor and glory to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.
springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in the courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness. Our risen and ascended Lord. Yes, he is. Yes. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. We celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Come on and celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. We celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. He is risen. He is, he is risen, he is risen, and he reigns forevermore. He is risen, he is risen, come on and celebrate, come on, come on and celebrate, come on, come on and celebrate. The resurrection of all God. We celebrate. Come on. Celebrate. Jesus, celebrate. Come on and celebrate. Celebrate. Jesus, celebrate. We celebrate. Celebrate. Jesus, celebrate. Yes, we celebrate. Come on. Celebrate. Jesus, celebrate. He is real. He is risen, he is risen, and he reigns forevermore. He is risen, he is risen, come on and celebrate, celebrate, come on and celebrate, come on, come on and celebrate. The resurrection of our God. We celebrate. One more time. Celebrate. Jesus, celebrate. Yes, we celebrate. Celebrate. Jesus, celebrate. 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 Jesus, celebrate. We celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. He Come is on. risen. He is risen. He is risen. And he reigns forevermore. He 
is risen. He is risen. Come on and celebrate. Come on. Come on and celebrate. Come on. Come on. Come on and celebrate. 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 The resurrection of our God. Bless the Lord. The yeah. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, Lord I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you're in my life. So glad you came. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My death you pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. So glad. Say, I'm so glad you're in my life. Yeah, yeah. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came. You came from heaven to earth. To show the way from the earth to the cross, my death you pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, one more. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. Yes, I'm so glad. Yes, I'm so glad you're in my life. So glad you came. I'm so glad you came to save us. Yes, you. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My day. You paid from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name yes, on high. Yes, you came from heaven. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My death you paid from the cross to the grave. From the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on. One more time, lift your name. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord. Lord, I lift your name on high. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, you have won Hallelujah. the victory. We are so grateful. Let's give the Lord some praise. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Come on, lift your name. Lift the name of Jesus up on high. Bless the Lord. Bless his holy name. Dance for the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. 
you have won the victory. Mighty Lord, hallelujah. So you have won it all for me. Death could not hold you down. No, no. You are the risen King. Yes, you are. You're seated in majesty. Yeah. You are the risen King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have won the victory. If you believe it, sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you have won it all for me. So death could not hold you down. No, no. You are the risen King. Yes, you are. You're seated in majesty. Yes, you are. You are the risen King. Hallelujah. Welcome back. And we give God thanks and praise for the opportunity to sing unto the Lord. That's what the psalmist says. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Let us continue to worship him this morning. We worship him now as we hear from his word. And today I want to share with you on two very important verses of scripture. The first is taken from John 3.16. And I'm sure we all know that verse of scripture by heart. We sing it, we say it, we preach it, we teach it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. The second verse or passage is taken from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 10, and I'm reading verse 34 and 35. However, I will make reference in the sermon to various passages as we go ahead. Acts chapter 10, and I'm reading verse 34 and 35. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. The King James Version says, God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. This is the word of the Lord, and I want to speak to you this morning on the heart of the gospel, the heart of the gospel. Let us pray. Father, you have spoken. Open our ears so that we will hear. And help us, Lord, when we hear, to follow, to be doers of your word. And Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together will be acceptable in your sight. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. John 3.16 This, my brothers and sisters, is perhaps the most quoted verse in the Bible. The most quoted verse in the scriptures. John 3.16 This verse has guided more persons to salvation than any other verse in the Bible. Martin Luther that great reformer refers to this verse as the heart of the Bible, the gospel in miniature. And it was described by C.H. Persian as the gospel in a nutshell. The gospel in a nutshell. John 3.16, and I'd like to focus on three phrases in the verse today. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. 
The first phrase, for God, reminds us of the existence of God. You notice I say it reminds us of the existence of God. For nowhere in the Bible is there ever an argument over the existence of God. The Bible never argues for the existence. The Bible simply affirms the existence of God. We see it in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. The Bible says, in the beginning, God. No argument, no quarrel. God. And here again in John 3.16, we hear John saying, for God so loved the world. And this, of course, answers questions that the atheists will ask. This verse reminds us that God is real. For God. For God. And it is only a fool who says in his heart that there is no God. Only a fool. So God so loved. God so loved. That's the next phrase. God so loved. And this reminds us of the essence of who God is. For God so loved. It reminds us of who God is. For God is love and love is God. God is love. That's, his, that's who he is. That's his essence. There are some people who would tell us that God doesn't really get involved in man's affairs. There are many who believe that God is, is a distant God, far away, not getting involved in our affairs. They have a very fatalistic view of life. They believe that what is to is, must is, as we say. What must, 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 must. That's how some people put it. But this verse tells us that God is not just a distant God. God is involved. He is moved. He is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. God so loved the world. God is intimately concerned with his creation. Isn't that wonderful to know? That the God who created the universe is concerned about his creation. He's concerned about you. He's concerned when you go through times of trial. He's concerned when you feel sick in your body. He's concerned when you are facing uh, people who are abusing you or misusing you. God is always concerned. And the Bible says he so loved. God so loved the world. And that brings me to the next verse where I'm going to spend most of my time this morning. For not only does this verse tell us of the existence of God, and not only do these phrases tell us about the essence of God, but it tells us the object of God's love. Who does God love? For God so loved the world. The world, brothers and sisters. And this phrase, the world, it, it, it focuses us on the object of God's love. That word, world, there is a Greek word, cosmos. Cosmos. And it means to order or to arrange in order, to fix in place, to arrange things in proper order. The cosmos. Uh, there's a sense in which that word cosmos is the, the, the foundation word for our English word cosmetics. Cosmetics, And you know, uh, a lot of you, before you go out anywhere, you have to fix your face. And you have to fix your hair. What you are doing there is cosmosing. You are fixing. You are putting things where they're supposed to be. You know, uh, if I were to see some of you before you did your cosmetics, I may not recognize some of you <laughs> because you, you fix so much that we don't even know who you are. And some people fixing these days until they are totally opposite to what they really are. But we're coming back to the text. The object of God's love is the cosmos, the ordered creation. The creation that God has brought into order and into discipline. The people whom God created those who are living, those who will live, and those who have lived, all make up the cosmos. They are all people whom God loves. God loves his creation. 
God loves you. He loves me. That song that we used to sing as children, you know, uh, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. We are precious in his sight. That is what this verse reminds us of, that God loves his world. He loves you. God doesn't only love Christians. God doesn't only love Trinidadians. God doesn't only love those who are white. He doesn't only love the Jews. God loves all of us. Every single human being. And my brothers and sisters, that is something we need to understand. If we are to reach out to the lost, if we are to reach out to those who are unsaved, we must love people the way God loves them. We must love people the way God loves them. In order to reach people, in order to teach people, you must love people. Amen? John 3.16, for God so loved whom? The world. The world. And this, my brothers and sisters, is the basis of all evangelism. It's the basis for God reaching out to man, and it is the basis for man reaching out to other men with the gospel, the euangelion, that good news of John 3.16. And I want to focus today now on the book of Acts because Acts chapter 10 demonstrates for us most powerfully John 3.16. Acts chapter 10, especially verses 34 and 35, God is no respecter of persons. God demonstrates his love in that passage. And I want you to read chapter 10. Read uh, Acts chapter 10 when you get a chance. Read Acts chapter 10, the entire chapter. That's your homework for, for this weekend. But in this chapter, God demonstrates his love to a Gentile centurion by using him to show to the Jewish Christians that his desire is to send the gospel to all the world and not just to the Jews. God used Peter and this centurion to destroy the barrier of prejudice that existed between Jews and Gentiles. Why? Because God loved the world and he wanted the gospel to reach the entire world. It could not have stayed just with the Jews. But Peter, like most Jews of his day, was so steeped in prejudice that he would never have had anything to do with a Gentile. Peter would have never had any interaction with the Gentile. Peter would not have been seen in the same house with a Gentile. Peter would not so much as even allow a Gentile to touch him. That's as far as his prejudice went. But in Acts chapter 10, God sends a vision to Peter. He tells Peter through this vision that he is to go and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. What did God do? Peter was praying on the roof one midday hour. And the Bible says God sent down. He saw a, a tablecloth as it were, a white cloth coming down from heaven. And on that tablecloth, the Bible tells us that there were all kinds of animals. Animals whose meat the Jews were not allowed to even touch. And so the Bible says that Peter heard a voice telling him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter, of course, said, No, Lord, not me. I will never eat anything that is common or unclean. But the Bible says God spoke to Peter and told him, Do not call anything that I have created common or unclean. What is the lesson that God was teaching Peter here? Do not call anything that I have created common or unclean. Do not despise anyone. Do not despise anyone, whether they're Jew, whether they're Gentile, whether they're black, whether they're white, whether they're brown, whether they're yellow. Do not despise anyone whom I have created. Because all of us are equal before God. Can I say that again, brothers and sisters? We are all equal before God. And 
And more than that, we are all equal at the foot of the cross. There is no king higher than any peasant at the foot of the cross. There is no boss higher than any servant at the foot of the cross. At the foot of the cross, we are all one. We are all level at the foot of the cross. But when we read Acts chapter 10, we realize certain things that are important for us this morning. First of all, in verses 1 to 8, we are reminded that all men are totally depraved. All men are totally depraved. Now, when I say depraved, I do not mean that man is un incapable of doing good. But when, the, when we use the phrase that man is depraved, it means that everything that he does is tainted with sin. It is tainted with sin. And therefore, there is nothing that we could do that could earn us righteousness before God. Nothing we could do. And that is very clearly pointed out to us in verses 1 to 8. Because we see Cornelius. Now the Bible tells us that he was a, a good man. He was a, a centurion, which means he was a boss. He, was, he had men working for him. And most likely he was a very good boss. And uh, he was a devout man. A man of character. One who feared God. A man of compassion. And his whole household gave arms. He was a man of generosity. He was always giving. He did well. But he still needed to come face to face with Jesus. He still had to put his faith in the finished work of Jesus, my brothers and sisters. What does it say to us? You could have a degree. Uh, yes, you could, you could be a good boss. You could be a very generous person. You know, you could be devout and you can be giving. You can be a good church member. You still have to come to know Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord. The church, my brothers and sisters, is not just for good people. The church is not just for good people, but for people who are forgiven. Hear what the Bible says. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. That has nothing to do with poverty. It has to do with when a person reaches to a place where they realize that they are bankrupt of righteousness. That their righteousness is like filthy rags before God. We must get to that place where we realize that there is nothing that we can do. There is no amount that we can give. No amount that we can pray that will ever make us righteous before God. That is what the Bible calls us to see, that men are all, we are all totally depraved before Almighty God. And Cornelius was an indication of that. For we have all sinned, the Bible says, and fall short of the glory of God. But God loves. God loves. That's what this passage tells us. And when we get to verse 8, from verse 8 uh, through Verse 9, sorry, to verse 16, it tells us that while all men are deprived and depraved, but God does not discriminate. God does not discriminate. The Lord was trying to teach Peter that you cannot hate someone who needs Jesus and claim that Jesus Christ is your Lord. That was the lesson God was teaching Peter. Brothers and sisters, let me say that again. You cannot hate someone who needs Jesus, and then claim that Jesus Christ is your Lord. Those two things cannot go together. You can't hate someone and then claim that they need Jesus. Yeah? And that's what the Lord was trying to teach Peter. And the Lord had to give Peter three lessons. He had to give Peter that vision three times. Three times, you know, when you read that passage of Scripture, you will see. Three times Peter saw this vision. That's because Peter was so steeped in his prejudice. You see, some people, we are so steeped in our prejudice. We are so uh, stubborn in our religion and our religiosity that God sometimes has to teach us something more than once, three, four, five times. And I thank God for his mercy and compassion in that regard. God is merciful. He's compassionate. He sends the hounds of heaven after us. He pursues us. 
Whatever he has to do, he pursues us. Why? Because he loves us. He loves us with an everlasting love. We cannot, brothers and sisters, claim that we, that we, that we are preaching the gospel to men when we hate people of different races. God is no respecter of persons. God doesn't discriminate with salvation. Amen? And it's the same way if we are to reach the lost, brothers and sisters, we cannot discriminate. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3 that we are to consider others above ourselves. The gospel is for all. The gospel is for every nation, every kindred, every tongue. Amen. And you and I do not know who God will save. How could we choose who to preach the gospel to? There are some of us, we are choosing who to preach the gospel to. We are only preaching to those who are within our demographic. We are only preaching to those people who look like us. We are preaching to people who do not come across as being antagonistic. No, we are called to preach to everyone. For God is no respecter of persons. Amen. God is no respecter. Of, and finally, not only... Is man totally depraved? And not only does God not discriminate, but the reason why we are Christians today, you and I are Christians today, because Jesus died. Jesus died. That was the message that Peter preached to Cornelius. The same Jesus who was crucified. We preach a crucified Savior. We preach that salvation is found in Christ and in Christ alone. We preach an exclusive gospel. There is an exclusivity about Christianity. We say that there is no other name under heaven whereby a man could be saved. We never ever move from that gospel. That is the gospel. That is the power of God unto salvation. That it is in Christ and in Christ alone. Jesus was the only one. Now, there were other people who were crucified on crosses before Jesus and after Jesus. And in fact, brothers and sisters, there were people named Jesus who had been crucified and killed in Jesus' days. There were people who were named Jesus who lived in his days. But Jesus alone can atone for the sin of man. His death was substitutionary. The Bible says he became sin for us, though he himself knew no sin, so that you and I could become the righteousness of God in Christ. It is in Christ alone, brothers and sisters. He alone died, and when he died, it made a difference. Something happened when Jesus died on the cross. Come on, somebody. Uh, physically, things happened in Jerusalem on that day that had never happened before. The Bible says the earth shook when Jesus died. That graves were opened when Jesus died. Oh, the Bible tells us that the, the veil of the temple was torn in two when Jesus died. And those, those were only some of the physical things, but there were some spiritual things that happened as well. Oh, glory to God. I believe that the devil was defeated on that day. Hallelujah. Sin was defeated on that day. Satan was defeated on that day. From that day onwards, all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ will now be saved from that day. Man is depraved. God does not discriminate. But thank God, Jesus died. Thank God, Jesus died. And I tell you today, brothers and sisters, that his death can make a difference in your life today. His death can make a difference in your life if you would only believe that God so loved you. He so loved you that if you believe, Jesus can make a difference in your life. He made a difference in my life. He took me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on a rock to stay. Amen. He, he changed my life. He delivered me from the power of sin and the guilt of sin and the penalty of sin. And now I know he touched me and made me whole. 
And he can do the same for you if you would believe. For God so loved the world that he gave. So that if you believe, you will not perish, but have everlasting life. And God is no respecter of persons today. If you believe, if you believe, and if you believe, and you believe, he will save you. And he will save you now. Amen and amen. Let us look to God in prayer at this time. I know that there are some persons who are going through their own challenges. Whatever your need may be today, we look to God. We have a word that we say here at St. John's that God is able, more than able, to do anything and everything according to His will and His plan in your life. So let's pray at this time. Let's ask God to deliver us. And there are some of you who are bound in sin, bound by alcohol and bound by drugs and bound by, 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 by adultery and fornication. I'm praying today that God will deliver someone who is hearing this message today. Let's pray. Father, we know that you are able to raise the dead. You are able, O oh God, because you raised up Jesus Christ from death. You broke the bands of death and you set him free. And now, God, we know that we have victory in Jesus Christ. And we claim that victory now, my God, for someone, someone who has been discriminated against. Someone, great God, who is suffering from the, the guiltiness of sins that they have committed in their lives. Lord, I pray right now that that person will be led to faith, led to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. And we know that if Jesus Christ is Lord, then everything else will take its rightful place. Father, we pray for those who are sick. Touch them today. Lord, I remember at this time those who have been diagnosed with cancer. I think of that young lady, Lord, in Princess Town. I think of, 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 of another one great God who's, who, who has been diagnosed with a, a brain tumor. Lord, I pray for them today, God, as you have already begun your work of healing and deliverance. Touch them and heal them now, O oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray for those who are struggling with depression and thoughts of suicide. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will reveal to yourself to them as the peace, the prince of peace. And Lord God, as they put their minds on you and they keep their minds stayed on you, give them perfect peace today. Lord, this is our prayer as we continue to pray for our nation. We continue to pray for the nations of the Caribbean and the nations of the world. Lord, we ask that you will continue to give hope in situations where people feel hopeless. And those, Lord God, who are dying, we pray that you will hold their hands and lead them through the valley of the shadow of death as they give their lives and hearts to you. Lord God, we ask that you will comfort those who are bereaved, the victims of suicide. Lord, we pray that you will comfort those who have been left behind. And may your grace and mercy and your peace from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit continue to rest, remain, and abide with us all, particularly, Lord, with the members of St. John's Baptist Church and all the members of the Baptist Union of Trent Tobago. Hear our prayer and bless us, we pray, for it is in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, let me once again say thank you for joining us today uh, in worship. I pray that your heart would have been blessed and touched from Almighty God. Please remember, uh, we have heard what our leaders have said, the Prime Minister and the Minister of Health and the healthcare professionals. We just need to be patient just for a little while longer, just for a short while longer. And I pray that you will heed the call to be patient, for it will soon be done and we will be hopefully back to some form of normal normalcy in the shortest possible time. So may God bless you, watch over you, and keep you today. And we close, of course, with a beautiful chorus uh, as we remember 
that God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Amen. Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed. Renew, flowing from the grace that I found in you. Lord, I come. To know the weaknesses I see in me will be stripped away by the power of your love. Hold me. unveil my eyes let me see you face to face knowledge. the knowledge of your love as you live in me Lord renew mind as your will unfolds in my life in living every day hey, by the power of your love hold me and hold me close your love surround me bring me near bring me near draw me to your side